Hey everybody, this is Tom Salemi of Device Talks. Welcome back to the Device Talks Weekly Podcast. We're only five days away or so from uh, Device Talks Boston. It's taking place on Wednesday, May 1st. I'm recording this late on Friday. We're uh, still busy ironing out all the details, but the agenda looks great. The numbers are great. We've already beaten last year's numbers, and I know we're going to blow past it considerably thanks to all of you. Uh, this is a uh, unique opportunity on a lot of different levels, and I really do hope if you haven't yet registered, you do. Uh, if you are interested in surgical robotics, if you're interested in cutting edge technologies in pulse field ablation, in IVF, in new materials, in neuromaterials, in new neural interfaces, in uh, sustainability, in startups, I don't know, we've got it all. Uh, it's going to be uh, just a jam packed couple of days. Uh, we'll have uh, presentations by Stryker, Medtronic, Intuitive. Uh, we'll have uh, an interview I'm doing with CRM. I, I start the whole thing with a, a great sit down with Beth McCombs of BD. She's chief technical technology officer. So uh, I don't know. We're going to have podcast recordings on the floor. We're going to have our live Device Talks Weekly podcast. The Device Talks Weekly you receive next week will be recorded live on stage at the very end of the conference. We hope you'll join us for that. So I don't know what else to tell you. Uh, I can share a little secret. In addition to the companies, uh, the robot, surgical robotics uh, companies we've been talking about, which include uh, Intuitive and Distal Motion and CRM and Striker and Quantum. Uh, and of course, Medtronic's going to be giving our joint keynote address to close things out. Uh, we're also going to have an appearance by Mira, the uh, the uh, robot built by Virtual Incision. This is not Space Mira, which went to space. This is a a, a copy, or rather a, a a version of the 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 Earth based Mira, which is a very cool surgical robotics. It'll be at at uh, Maxon's booth on the floor. So uh, come down and check out Mira. It's going to be uh, just I don't know. I'm really excited. I can't wait to get there. It's a lot of work. I'm a bit tired, but I uh, can't wait to uh, to have you see all that we have been working on. So uh, with that, we've got a podcast dedicated exclusively to the conference. I'll open up. Paul Grand and I, of course, will sort of uh, catch up on uh, where MedTech Innovator is. We'll have a great venture panel for you at 1.30 on May 2nd. Get to see Mike Carusi of, of uh, Lightstone. I haven't seen him in a, in a long time. And we'll have Dan Sheehan from Medtronic and others as well uh, on that panel. Uh, and uh, in addition to that, we'll have a Holly Scott's CEO transition panel following that. So the innovation forum is jam-packed and ready to go. Our other tracks, we've added an additional track this year. So we'll even, even have more content going on. Uh, there's over 120, probably 130 speakers by now. And uh, it's just, it's going to be insanely fun. And uh, if you're on the fence, get off the fence and come down to the Boston Convention and Exhibition Center. Uh, we'll have our Women in MedTech Networking Breakfast, which is unfortunately sold out. Uh, it sold out quickly in a week. Uh, we added more space and that sold out as well. So we'll be doing this again next year and we'll, we'll do it on a larger scale. Um, so, lo- so, so much enthusiasm and optimism coming up. Uh, and again, join us on a- April 30th. That's when we're having our opening uh, opening reception. It is a take me out to the ball game sort of theme. So we're encouraging people to wear their uh, favorite team's hat, cap, shirts, whatever you want to bring. And uh, we'll have some, obviously some food and some games associated with that as well. So it's a great way to start uh, on April 30th from 5 to 7. And then, of course, uh, the show starts on May 1st at 9 o'clock. I'll be opening it up with Paul Grand. We'll have a, a presentation by HSBC, sort of giving us an overall view of the numbers. And then I get to uh, interview Beth McCombs of BD. So, And then we're off to the races. So thank you to everyone who has been part of this planning process. Thanks to all the speakers who are coming out. Thanks to all their uh, colleagues who have helped schedule things. Um, and thanks, of course, to everyone who has registered. As I said, we've already uh, got a bigger event than we did last year. And last year was pretty big. And we've still got several days for registrations. So um, don't miss out. Please join us. You can still use the code DTWeekly25 to save 25%. Uh, Jeff Karp, who was on the podcast uh, last week, will be there, of course, as well. Uh, And if you want to qualify for his free book, Lit, use the code LIT25 
to save 25% off the price of registration. And you'll also be eligible for a free book. He's going to choose a handful of folks to get free books. And uh, that could be you. So Jeff will be at the opening reception uh, talking one-on-one. -on -one. It won't be an address, but more just an, an opportunity to uh, to talk with really one of uh, one of MedTech's greatest uh, innovators. So innovators is my Boston accent. Innovators. Uh, so please, uh, I got nothing else to say. Please join us at Device Talks Boston once again, May 1st and 2nd, otherwise known as Wednesday and Thursday at the Boston Convention and Exhibition Center. Now we will uh, get this podcast started. After I talk with Paul, uh, we will hear from three of our speakers from Device Talks Boston. These are folks that I uh, spoke with while I was visiting um, the Mulling Group Studios, 160 Studios in Boston. So I'll, uh, I'll hop in and introduce each of them as, they, uh, as they're ready to play. So thanks again, folks, for listening to this episode of the Device Talks Weekly Podcast. And I really do hope you'll join us at Device Talks Boston. Let's get this podcast started. All right, you ready for this? Ready. Paul Grant, welcome back to the podcast. Thank you very much, Tom Salemi. Great to be here, as always. It's hard to believe, Paul. Only a few days away from Device Talks Boston. How can that be? We just had Device Talks Boston in 2023, <laughs> like last week, it feels like. I don't know it, how this happens. I don't know, man. I don't know. And it feels like, uh, I, don't, it, it's, I don't know if they're getting harder, but there's more to them. And you, you folks have gone nuts on the, uh, the innovation side of things with, with MedTech Innovator. Uh, and nuts in a good way, I should say, with the great companies you have and the investors we've got lined up and the panels and, and, and things like that. So once again, thank you for uh, for all the work that MedTech Innovator does to help us out with Device Talks Boston. It's a real treat to work with you and your team. Oh, we, we love doing it. It's a phenomenal event. Uh, it's a great, a great opportunity to get together a lot of our companies, to get together investors and, and then all those other people. I mean, you've got such a huge number of attendees coming to Device Talks now. Um, that it's just a great, you know, kind of mecca for people who want a little bit of everything. Um, whether you want to learn about, you know, the the developing technologies, you want to see robotics, you want to, you know, meet with product people, or you know, or kind of anything along the way, um, it's all there. So uh, yeah. we, we we love going. It it really is uh, when you start with the blank agenda slate, as you know, it can be a little terrifying. But uh, as you start to find elements and, and start to fill out the the canvas, uh, it really gets exciting when you get closer and closer. So yeah, we'll have great surgical robotics talks, uh, innovative technologies like IVF and pulse field ablation. But um, I really again happy to have uh, the MedTech Innovator folks there. And we gave you the big room because you guys just, you were, you could not be contained by, by a 150 person track room. You needed more and more space. And I won't make the goldfish reference again because it confused a lot of people on our last podcast. I thought it made sense, but, uh, but you once, you, you, you did indeed grow into this, this large 500 person room that we gave you. So, so well done. Well, thank you. And, uh, and yeah, we, we had last year was the first time we did this investor forum for graduates of MedTech Innovator. For those of you who uh, haven't, weren't there or haven't heard of this before, um, usually MedTech Innovator features only the companies that are in a particular cohort for, you know, for that year. And we do that at AdvaMed's annual meeting and the Wilson Sonsini annual conference and others. Um, but for the first time last year, we did this investor forum at Device Talks for graduates in MedTech Innovator. And we've been, people have been asking us for that for, uh, for a very long time because those companies are the ones that are further along in many cases, um, you know, or they're moving along. They've, you know, they've raised more capital. They've made more progress. And uh, like everybody, they need, to, they need to raise more funding to achieve those milestones. And we weren't previously like featuring them in a particular uh, venue. So now we've aligned with you and this is the second year doing it. Last year, you're right, was standing room only. And, um, and that was amazing. I mean, literally I was on the stage trying to pull people 
into seats. And at a certain point, you know, and you, you know, you're like, oh, row three has uh, one seat. And uh, <laughs> at a certain point, there was no more, there was literally no more seats. And, and then people were out in the hallway and, you know, outside of the, the room, like peeking in through the door over people's heads. And I was like, this is crazy. Uh, there's a lot of interest here. So that's the thing that's exciting is that, um, you know, these companies that we're featuring are not just some, you know, random companies that, you know, were picked out of, out of the sky or, or that just, you know, paid to be, pr to be featured at your event. These are literally some of the top emerging startups in the entire med tech industry. Um, and people are very, very interested in seeing them. And it, you don't even have to be an investor. You know, you might be someone from one of the strategics or you might be a service provider and otherwise, whatever, whatever your role in the, the ecosystem is, um, these are the companies you're going to want to know because I can promise you they, these will be the products that we'll all be using and they probably just will have a new name after they get, you know, acquired by somebody larger and get rolled up into something bigger. But there, there's no question, these companies, the, the 28 we're featuring, um, are going to be products that um, uh, we all will be, uh, you know, looking at and working with on the market. So it's a great time to get to know them. Absolutely. So, so let's unbox the agenda. Uh, you and I will kick things off in the morning uh, on May 1st, and then we'll be followed by uh, Matt Griffiths from uh, HSBC, who's, who HSBC came in as a, a sponsor of Device Talks Boston for our innovation track because they wanted to work with, with you on, on the, uh, on the MedTech Innovator All-Stars. So uh, Matt Griffiths from HSBC will kick off and then, uh, I'll use the big room. You'll let me use the big room for our opening keynote with Beth McCombs. <laughs> and then we'll hand it off to you. So, uh, and we'll have our, our, our presentations or our, our panel discussions by our folks at Greenberg Traurig and uh, Goodwin. And then on day two, we'll have uh, presentations by Cambridge Design Partnership. And then at, in the afternoon, we'll also have a discussion led by Holly Scott of the Mullings Group, uh, really focused on succession planning transitioning out of a, from a founder to a CEO, and you're going to be on that, that panel as well. So I highlighted all the non-pitch stuff. Talk to us a bit about the, the companies that will be present, presenting. You, you've talked a little bit before, but uh, what was the process to, to attract these people? I know you had a, a lot to draw from, uh, and I think it was a you had some tough decisions to make to pick the right companies. Yeah, as yeah. always. I mean, MedTech med Innovator is nothing but, but hard decisions. <laughs> um, as, as you know too well, you know, we have this embarrassment of riches in the fact that, you know, um, in a particular year, um, like this year, 2024, um, we had across our, our three different programs, we had 2,200 applicants, 2,200 companies apply to be in MedTech Innovator. And somehow we have to go from 2,200 down to about 100 that make it in. So it's about 5% that get accepted to our programs. And, um, and that, that's the way it is every year, it's just incredibly um, rich and, um, and detailed selection process involving like 500 people who select these companies. So to make it into MedTech Innovator is, you know, as tough as getting into one of those really um, difficult schools terms of being accepted. <laughs> and, and, then, uh, and then once you get in, um, you get a ton of mentorship and guidance and these companies become so much better. They really become investable. And that's the word I've been using lately. These are investable companies. Um, they're not just good ideas. They're not just unmet medical needs. These are investable companies. And as a result, um, when we look at any particular year, like looking back at 2023, um, literally 28% of all of the capital raised in the entire med tech industry went to graduates of med tech innovator, um, which uh, for some people is always difficult to process. It's difficult for me to process that that large percentage of the emerging med tech space are graduates of med tech innovator. What's the percentage again? Um, 28% wow, okay. of all the financing went to graduates of med tech innovator. Uh, and, and so when you think about, you know, people struggle to raise capital. I mean, that's just a fact in this industry. Um, I say all the time, it's way too hard to, uh, help people live long, healthy lives. Like it should be much easier. People should just be throwing money. It should be raining down on these companies. Amen. Um, but they're not, they're raining on down on the next AI or, or TikTok. Well, maybe not TikTok <laughs> anymore after the vote. Um, but but anyways, the point is, um, it should be easier. And we're trying to make it easier. But but overall, the, the companies that are the outliers, the ones that do survive, that do raise capital, 
tend to be graduates of MedTech Innovator. And so the forum that we have at Device Talks Boston on May 1st and May 2nd features graduates of MedTech Innovator. So these are not new companies that are going into this year's program. These are graduates from prior years. And that means we have kind of a uh, a menagerie, if you will, of startups of a varying stage. We have companies everywhere from preclinical to being on the market and at their growth stage. Um, we have companies that are raising a seed round, a series A round, a B round, and a C round in terms of the stage of, of round, uh, and anywhere from $1.5 million to $55 million um, in those rounds. So a real uh, diverse set of companies in terms of stage, uh, the amount of capital they're raising. You know, I think the average raise right now is 14 million that these companies are seeking. And one particular feature that I'm most excited about um, is that most of these companies, the majority of the companies we'll be featuring in Boston already have lead investors or significant committed capital in the round. Wow. So if you're an investor, you're just a lot of the hard work's been done. A lot of the hard work has been done. You just show up and <laughs> see a great company and write a check. That's that's what we're doing here. Um, and uh, no joke. I mean, when I talk to our companies, um, it's no surprise perhaps to you, but maybe for some of the listeners out there that um, 95% of investors after you meet with them will say something like this. Wow, really exciting um, we're definitely interested. Come back to me when you have a lead investor. Mm -hmm. um, meaning that, you know, you're not saying no, you're not saying yes. You don't want to miss out on the deal. You don't want to be responsible for making the hard decisions about whether or not to write the check um, uh, or to lead this round. You know, you don't want to be the key person responsible for this company in the future. You just want to participate if somebody else who's done the hard work um, is, uh, is taking the lead. So, We've done it. We've go. done that for you. We vetted them uh, through MedTech Innovator. And then uh, other investors have now stepped up and, uh, and taken those lead positions or committed large chunks of capital. Like one of our companies is, um, is there uh, in brain, uh, is raising a $55 million round, and they only have $7.5 million left. Um, this is not a solicitation for investment, by the way. I don't want to violate any SEC regulations. Um, I'm just stating a fact that, um, you know, these are companies that, um, you know, if you're an accredited investor um, and uh, you would, you'd be interested in, these are good opportunities. Um, these are great opportunities uh, amongst the field of thousands, as I said, thousands of companies that apply to MedTech Innovator. We're giving you 28 companies who are highly vetted, who've got investors committed in most cases and um, are just terrific companies that um, that you should all be interested in meeting. Yeah, if, if uh, folks, well, Carolina Aguilar uh, will be uh, not only presenting in the afternoon on behalf of InBrain, she's the CEO, but she'll be on a, a panel in the in the morning in Neuro. So if, you're, if anyone's curiosity is piqued by InBrain's opportunity, you'll have two opportunities to, to hear her speak public, publicly before you can talk with her privately, of course. Uh, you folks, this for the first time on our website, you've uh, put together a really great um, page, but a sortable page that, that can really give people all the information they need about the, the presenting companies. And I, and I think if any investors are listening and, and their curiosity is peaked, if you reach out to either Paul or me on LinkedIn, uh, you've got a lookbook too that we can send out to folks directly if they want to get a sense of who's presenting and uh and get their little more on their stories so uh we've got all the resources there for investors who want to want to come out uh and if you're interested in attending also just just reach out to paul and me on linkedin and uh we'll make sure that uh that you're in the room to hear these great stories we've got a lot of investors already but uh the more money the better i think right paul absolutely yep. and you know in addition to an investors as i always say you know these are these are companies you might want to work for. Like you yep. might want to quit your job and go work for. Um, these are the leading emerging startups that will eventually be the products that um, we see with big big name labels on them. Um, we've got technologies in in the cardio space, the neuro space, the ortho space, uh, lung, derm, maternal care, imaging, robotics. Like there's something um, probably for everyone in terms of, you know, expertise you may have. If you're at another company, you're saying, boy, I've always wanted to join a startup. Um, you're going to want to come in and listen to these companies 
uh, in the presentations and then just go meet with them yep. um, afterwards. Uh, because it's just, uh, it, it, these are the companies, uh, people ask me all the time. I, I get messages constantly, as you probably do on LinkedIn from people saying, hey, I'm looking for a change in my career. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, do you know any good companies that, you know, are looking for management um, in various ways? It doesn't have to be the CEO. It could be, you know, a commercial officer, a product development, whatever it is. Um, and these are the companies. Like if you want to go find companies that um, are the fast train to, uh hopefully success on the market and, uh, and exits. Um, these are the ones, um, we made it easy for you. Yep. This is not, as I said, this is not your typical pitch thing where it's like a bunch of companies from the local university and most of them won't go anywhere. These companies are all going somewhere. Yep. Um, they're already there as a matter of fact. I mean, they're, they're already, they're already, there. <laughs> they're already there. Uh, you're right. They're already there. Yeah. Um, and I'm not, I'm not overstating that. These companies are already there. Yep. Um, these are the ones that, um, that you know, you will be reading about. You're already reading about, as you said. They're on your panels for a reason in some cases yep. because they're, you know, they're incredible companies. Um, so uh, I, as I said, you know, I can't say it enough. The, um, the These sessions are, are designed to be bite-sized. Um, you know, they're like hour-long sessions um, where we'll have about 20 one companies in in total um, presenting over these three sessions. So seven companies, seven or eight companies per session um, in an hour. You get to meet seven companies and then you can go network and meet with them uh, in between. And then another session. Uh, so we have two of them on the first day on May 1st. So they're just one hour. I mean, we made it really, again, made it easy for you. You don't have to sit around for six hours and watch pitches. Mm-hmm. You go for an hour, watch it, watch seven or eight pitches, meet with some companies, go to the rest of the, you know, stay in the room for the rest of the content. As you said, it's the big room um, with the keynotes and everything else. And then uh, then you get another session in the afternoon on the first. And then on the second, we have another one of those. Uh, we've got our investor panel. And um, and we also have a, uh, a great panel on CEO transition. So lots of lots of great content uh, and uh, and something, as I said, for everybody not to be missed. Um, so if you're not registered for Device Talks, definitely message me, Paul Grand, on LinkedIn, message Tom Salemi on LinkedIn. Mm-hmm. Um, we will get you in. Um, you're you're not going to want to miss this. In fact, Paul, as you were talking, I looked at the agenda. I think we have at least five or, or six uh, MedTech Innovator alum on panels as as accomplished executives speaking as experts in their field. So you are you are you are helping to fund the next generation of, of MedTech leaders, which is exciting. In fact, I, I was curious: Have you had a repeat? You've been doing this for 10 years or so. Have you had someone who's gone through with one company and have come through with a second? Have you seen that yet? Absolutely. Oh, yeah. So, okay. uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we had, um, so a uh, company you featured on Device Talks s- several times, uh, Moon Surgical. Oh, okay. Um, is led by uh, Anne Ostois, yep. who is a uh, second. She was in MedTech Innovator um, and, uh, and she with Moon Surgical. Um, and then previously, she was in MedTech Innovator for Safe Heal. Okay. Um, another, both companies out of MD Start, um, which is a Sofanova um, entity in Paris. And um, so we've had her uh, as a two time uh, MedTech Innovator serial uh, company. We also have had Derek Herrera, mm-hmm. um, who has Bright Euro currently right now. Um, you know, uh, Derek is a, an accomplished leader in our space and a Two time medtech uh, innovator entrepreneur. Um, we had Alex, Alex Schuler, um, who's currently leading Selvi, um, who also had another company previously that was acquired um, that was a medtech innovator graduate. So we've had at least three. And I think this year we probably have um, at least two or three that are prior. I'm not going to say who they are yet. Mm-hmm. Uh, if they don't make it, I don't want to embarrass them. But um, but companies that were again uh, medtech innovator um, graduates, and then the CEO went on to start another company, and uh, and they came back to MTI. Very cool. Um, so we're, we're we're seeing it more and more often. All right. So to sum up, uh, if you're an investor listening to this and you're intrigued, reach out to Paul and myself. We'll send you or my and or myself uh, and or me. I don't know if I should use myself and or me, uh, and uh, we could send you the relevant information and little just a little little something else we'll share with you. And uh, if you are interested in working for startups, Paul, that's a great point. You should definitely come on out. You can use the code uh, DTWeekly25 to save 25%. So it gets the price of the administ- of uh, registration down to about 500 bucks or so. So that's that's not a bad investment in your next 
career. Uh, if you're one of our sponsors, you're certainly going to want to watch these and, and, and connect with uh, these future customers of yours. If you need product design, if you're offering product design help or manufacturing. Uh, so lots of opportunities. And unfortunately, uh, we don't do remote. So if you think you can log on and, and share in this experience, we don't offer that at Device Talks. We're not able to do that at the moment. I don't know if we ever want to, because I really like seeing people. And I spend my entire rest of my year in virtual digital world. I like really to see people in, in the flesh. So hope folks will uh, will heed this, uh, I don't want to say warning, heed this message and uh, join us at Device Talks in Boston, uh, May 1st and 2nd, next Wednesday and Thursday. My God, it's here, Paul. It's here. It's here. It's exciting. It's one week away. If it's today, you're listening to this. And if it's tomorrow or the next day, it's a little less. But believe me, it's worth going. Um, if you haven't registered yet and you're going, ah, maybe I missed it. It's too late. It's not too late. Um, reach out to us. Register for the conference. Um, reach out to us if you're an investor um, so we can take care of you. Um, and one of the things for investors that I'll mention is uh, a difficult thing for investors, in addition to finding good companies, is also finding other investors to co-invest mm. with. Um, uh, investors, unfortunately, spend a lot of their time trying to fill out rounds for companies that they're excited about. So they're reaching out to other investors. This is a great networking opportunity to meet with around 50 investors who will be there, who are actively investing in the med tech space. So if you're an investor, that's another great reason to come to this, uh, to this event uh, because you're going to get a chance to network with other investors. So... Uh, looking forward to seeing you in uh, a week, Tom. I know. Uh, or a little less than a week. Uh, it's going to be a tremendous event. Absolutely. Well, thanks again, Paul Grand and MedTech Innovator for uh, putting on putting together a great show. And uh, can't wait to see you in Boston. Can't wait. See you soon. All right. It was great to hear from Paul Grand. Now we're going to review uh, the, some of the rest of the agenda. It'd be foolish to say these three interviews encompass the entire agenda, but uh, we'll be talking about surgical robotics a lot, and two of these interviews will be surgical robotics focused. This first one is a conversation I had with Bertine Hume. He is the CEO and co-founder of Quantum Surgical, which is uh, developing Epion, which is um, a, a surgical robotics system that is used to uh, remove um, growths in the lung or treat the lung. So, it's a, a unique uh, focus for surgical robotics. Uh, Bertine will get into his background, but he's done this before, and we'll learn about that success. But as I mentioned up top, in addition to Quantum, we'll have presentations by Stryker, uh, a keynote interview by me with the executives from CRM. We'll have presentations by uh, Brian Miller of Intuitive, who's going to go over the power of DaVinci 5. We'll have Greg Roach, who was on the podcast a couple of weeks ago from Distal Motion. And uh, we will close it all out. And you'll hear from uh, him a little bit later in this podcast. But Rajit Kamel will give the closing keynote. So um, I know it's a lot of surgical robotics. As I wrote in my email this week, it wasn't really intended to uh, to be such a focus of the po conference. But uh, it was impossible really not to bring this much into what's going into the conference because of all that's gone on with surgical robotics. I really do think 2024 is going to be one of those pivotal years with the uh, approval of Da Vinci 5, with the uh, advances of uh, Hugo, with uh, Mirror, Space Mirror being sent to space. And I mentioned that uh, Virtual Incisions Mirror Robot will be at Device Talks Boston in the Maxim booth on the floor. So come check that out. It's a really cool design. I'll definitely be uh, posing a, with a selfie, I hope, if I have a moment to get down there to uh, visit Mira. I'd uh, love to take a picture of it and uh, share that on social. So you should do the same. You should come to Device Talks Boston, get that selfie, get that social media campaign going. So, uh, all right, let's uh, play this interview that I did with Bertina Hume. Again, I did this at the, uh, the interview. I did the interview at the 160 Studios, which is Joe Mullings, the Mullings Group Studios in Florida. So uh, I'm just going to play it all. We also also have video versions of this online and uh, on our YouTube channel. So if you want to watch it, go to our YouTube channel, Device Talks. It's our YouTube channel. Subscribe, and you can you can watch me talk to Bertine. So all right, we'll get this interview going.
Hi, everyone. Tom Salemi of Device Talks. Back here again to talk about Device Talks Boss. And as I've mentioned in the past, we have a great focus on surgical robotics. And uh, I, I mentioned in a conversation with Joe Mullings that we seem to be at a point where the, the, the whole sector is changing. New models, new technologies, new approaches are coming in. So I'm very happy to have as uh, one of the presenters at Device Talks Boston, Britannia Hume, who is the CEO of Quantum Surgical. He's going to be talking about their very unique surgical robotic system. So, Bertin, thanks for joining us uh, on the show. Hi, Tom. So, uh, why don't we just take a moment just to introduce folks to, to Quantum Surgical? I know, and in, in, in that, perhaps you could give a little bit of your background because you uh, you've done this before. You're you're going around for your, your your second go around in surgical robotics. Yes, indeed. My name is Bertin Nehum. And yes, indeed, I'm, I'm an engineer by background, and I've been in the field of medical surgical robotics for over 20 years now. And as you mentioned before, uh, I had a previous company uh, called Medtech Surgical. We designed uh, and sold the robot called Rosa. The company was acquired by Zima Biomet in 2016. And as far as I know, at the date of today, Zima Biomet uh, is declaring an install base of over 1,000 Rosa worldwide. Okay. So I think pretty well. So now uh, I'm, I'm here to talk about a, a new story, uh, a new venture that uh, I, I created with some of my co-founders uh, in 2017 and uh, 18, sorry, uh, almost uh, six years ago. Yeah. Um, so we are now trying to pioneer robotics on a totally new field, uh, namely oncology. Mm -hmm. Epion, uh, which is the name of our robot. Uh, Epion, by the way, was named after the name of a, of a goddess, uh, which is the, the, the goddess of soothing. She's the wife of Asclepius. And um, so Epion is used for minimal invasive treatment of patients suffering from abdominal tumors. So basically, Epion is used to help physicians uh, delivering to uh, the uh, patient uh, this uh, minimal invasive treatment called percutaneous ablation. Mm. So what is the what is the problem with the or the limitations of the the current standard of treatment? Yeah. So uh, first of all, one thing which is very important to to explain is you know that's always been the concept of my different companies, and I think that's the concept of most surgical robotics companies. We are not here to basically create a new treatment. Mm -hmm. uh, our uh, objective is through robotic assistance, democratize a treatment, usually a minimal invasive treatment, which benefits are undisputable, but because it is so difficult to be carried out, only a limited number of physicians can perform this minimal invasive treatment. Therefore, only a, mini, a limited number of patients can benefit from this treatment. So, that's exactly what we are doing uh, with uh, in oncology with Epion. So basically, uh, just a few words to explain what is uh, percutaneous ablation. That's an alternative to surgery. Uh, let's say, for example, a patient which is diagnosed with a, with a tumor in the liver. The standard treatment would be surgery, mm -hmm. uh, consisting in basically opening, uh, you know, the, the, the belly and removing one part of the of the liver where the tumor is located. Uh, this treatment is quite efficient, but as one can imagine, it's very heavy. Uh, you know, uh, it, you know, for the patient, it takes a long time to, to, to recover. And also, it's not always possible, depending on where the tumor is located, and especially when there are multiple lesions. Uh, the alternative was created over 20 years ago, which is a minimal invasive percutaneous ablation that consists in inserting a needle through the skin. This needle is going to be uh, to target the lesion. The needle is linked to some kind of generator, cryo, or whatever, which is going to burn locally uh, the tumor. So mm -hmm. this is a very efficient treatment, uh, which is the recommended treatment by the guidelines for early stage cancer. However, one can easily imagine that targeting a few millimeter diameter lesions uh, with uh, a needle on a patient that is breathing with on the, you know, an organ that is also moving is something which is very difficult. 
As a result of that, only a limited number of physicians are capable of performing safely this treatment. Therefore, only a limited number of patients can benefit from that. So mm. our objective, our mission is to democratize through robotics, help more physicians, therefore more patients benefiting from this treatment. And how is your how is everyone able to, to do that? What what abilities do you give it? Do you give the surgeon that they don't otherwise have themselves? So so we are in something which is quite common in robotics, which is so-called image guided treatment. Mm -hmm. So basically it's always the same paradigm. You're going to download the images of the patient. In this case, uh, this is a CT, CT images. On a console, you can recreate in 3D, you know, the patient anatomy. You're going to plan virtually the ideal position of the, of the needle. You can basically define virtually quite a few parameters. I'm not going to, to go too much in, in details. And once this is done, this information is going to be sent to the robot and the robot is going to position automatically a guide through which the, the physician is going to insert the needle with uh, you know knowing that the needle will be exactly on position. So uh, that's roughly speaking what the robot is doing, which is very similar to that, that what you, you seeing, you can see for many, many, many uh, image guided robotic devices, mm -hmm. like Rota, obviously, but also, you know, Mako or all the and final question, where are you in your commercial rollout? I know you're you're here in the US now. Uh, give us a sense of, of where, what Quantum is looking forward to over the next year or two. So we are uh, so we are at a commercial stage, meaning that we have already sold uh, this device. At the, top, at the date of today, over 400 patients have been successfully treated thanks to EPION in Europe and the US. Uh, we have uh, done our first installations in the U.S. Uh, the first uh, hospital to acquire the system in the U.S. is Baptist Hospital in Miami. Mm -hmm. uh, and I am here uh, in, in Miami in the U.S. to basically, uh, you know, conduct, uh, you know, the, 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 the deployment, the commercial deployment of our technology uh, in the U.S. in a very similar fashion as what I did maybe 10 years ago with my previous company when it was to basically deploy, you know, the, the, the commercial, uh, you know, deployment of Rosa in the U.S. So that's what I'm doing right now. Exciting times. Well, I appreciate your taking a, a day out of your uh, busy schedule. I'm sure to be part of Device Talks Boston. Again, people can come and hear the uh, Epilon and Quantum Surgical story there. And uh, thank you for joining us today on the show. Appreciate you. Know, very grateful for the insights and the time. Thank you, Tom. All right, we'll take a break from surgical robotics to uh, focus on the neurospace. Next is Kurt Hagstrom. He's the chief commercial officer at Synchron. And uh, it, I, this is a, an area I'm particularly excited about, neuro. It's always been a space that I love. I remember talking about neuropace back in the late 90s and being fascinated by the use of, uh, of energy to uh, basically replicate what drugs can do. So, uh, but we are, we are, a long way from uh, when I started covering this industry in 1998. And uh, we're at a point where there seems to be a, a real, uh, like with surgical robotics, a real um, platform upon which we can leap forward. And we'll talk about that on uh, on May 1st. I'll lead a, a panel discussion with uh, with Kurt Hagstrom of Synchron, who you'll hear from shortly. We'll have Carolina Aguilar, who we mentioned earlier as a medtech innovator. Uh, she'll be pitching her company at MedTech Innovator, but she'll also be talking about InBrain and uh, its BCI application, Brain Computer Interface application, which is something Synchron's working on as well. We'll have uh, Imran Iba there, who, who is a, a, a very experienced investor from uh, Action Potential Venture Capital. And Imran really kind of, uh, I think, brought some cautiousness. He added the cautious to the cautious optimism turn. Uh, it, so it'll be a really balanced uh, uh, discussion in that way. And finally, we'll have Shriya Srinivasan of Harvard. She was in the podcast a month or two ago uh, talking about all that they're doing in the neurospace. And in addition to ingestible pills, they've got some work that they're doing with musculature and uh, just uh, going to be a real look into the future of neuro. So 
Enjoy this conversation with Kurt Hagstrom of Synchron. But if you want the full experience, of course, join us at Device Talks Boston on May 1st for this conversation on Neuro. You can go to boston.devicetalks.com to register. All right, we'll get this interview going with Kurt Hagstrom. Hey everybody, this is Tom Salemi of Device Talks. We're uh, taking a look at the agenda for Device Talks Boston, which is happening on May 1st and May 2nd at the Boston Convention and Exhibition Center. Really excited to focus a part of the, part of the agenda on the neurospace. We're going to have a really fascinating panel I'm excited to see called What New Materials and Interfaces Will Advance Neurotechnologies? Very happy to have one of the panelists here. It's Kurt Hagstrom. He is Chief Commercial Officer at Synchron. Kurt, thanks for joining us uh, in this discussion. Hey, absolutely. Thanks for having me, Tom. And thanks for, for being part of Device Talks Boston. I know it's a bit of a homecoming for you, so glad to, it is, glad to have you back in the Bay State. <laughs> so uh, let's, uh, we, we like to build our agenda around uh, problems and solutions. We like to find those solutions. So let's first identify the problem that led to Synchron's uh, founding or the founding of its technology, the, the, the brain-computer interface. What, what problem are you trying to solve with existing uh, neurosystems? Yeah, the the uh, really innovation that that stemmed in the ideation of of Synchron's uh, technology, which is a, a brain computer interface, um, started back with uh, Dr. Tom Oxley, uh, you know, one of our founders and, and uh, now CEO of the company. And this was uh, in regards to you know he's a stroke interventionalist, and mm-hmm. he saw a need with folks that um, would have a brainstem stroke and then would would render them par- uh, paralyzed, and they didn't have the ability to. In um, this instance, is a lot of times speak or move, and um, although the person's still there, they still cognitively, uh, you know, have their thoughts and abilities and emotions, um, but they had no physical ability. And so, you know, the the thought was, um, and brain computer interfaces have been out there, but the thought was, hey, can we develop a technology that allows these people to have uh, independence or autonomy back in their life and to utilize technology as we uh, able-bodied people do? So that's really where the 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 need started was trying to um, deliver, uh, re- restore that element of, of independence uh, through motor function. That's fascinating. I didn't know that was the origin. I love it when simple questions can kind of be so uh, re- provide revealing answers. So mm-hmm. what is the solution that Synchron is is developing? Yeah, it's a, it's a neurotechnology called uh, a brain-computer interface. And this is a, um, a technology um, that we deliver through an endovascular approach. And so this means endovascular means that you take the vasculature, so you take the blood vessels um, to the, the, the location. So in our instance, we, we take a device and we put it through the blood vessels up into the brain. And that, uh, called, the device is called the stentrode. Um, and this device looks like a stent and, and, and then has also a lead attached to it. And this device records the signals of the brain. Um, those signals then get translated into uh, digital motor outputs. So these mo- instead of uh, a functional motor output like we think moving your arms and legs, your your fingers to to use your smartphone, these are now digitized to allow that same functionality in the digital world um, using those same uh, motor intent signals. And where are you in your developments? Now, tell us a little bit about Synchron. You folks have had some some great progress. Now you have re- uh, released some uh, peer reviewed data at the end of last year in, in regarding the performance of your of your system. Talk a bit about the state of Synchron and, and where you're at in development. Yeah, so we've, uh, Synchron's been around for about 10 years. Um, we have now uh, conducted our first human trial that was uh, in Australia called the SWITCH trial. And those uh, results were published in uh, JAMA Neurology uh, this past year. Um, so very excited about that. And that really kind of put the stamp on the, the safety profile of our approach. Um, we next uh, conducted a um, early feasibility trial here in the United States. Um, we have now finished enrollment with that. That was another six patients um, uh, here in the United States. And that, and that trial right now called the command trial is ongoing. So we're, we're doing our follow-up in that study, uh, both from a safety follow-up. It's really a safety study, but doing the safety follow-up as well as working with the patients on uh, different you know, activities that they do uh, throughout the day that, that can add value from an independent standpoint. So that's, that's where we're at right now. We're in that trial, uh, mid, mid-trial, um, but we're also prepping and preparing for that next clinical step um, to test the, the next-gen system. And that, that leads into the final question as to where are you headed? What's the next couple of years hold for you? You're chief commercial officer, so it suggests yeah. that there's, there's some there there and you folks are moving forward. What are, what are you looking forward to hopefully executing in the next couple of years? 
Yeah. So it's, it, it's, it's a great question because I, I get that a lot being a commercial <laughs> person, right? You know, having that title as a commercial person, but um, maybe what, for, uh, what folks don't realize is that, um, you know, in, in the med device industry, a lot of the commercial folks actually have a technical background. And so um, I do as well. So I'm an engineer by trade. And, and so I actually help uh, bringing the voice of, uh, you know, our future users of the system uh, to the development side. So you're really on the marketing, kind of the upstream marketing side of things, making sure that you're you're developing a, a commercially viable product, right? And so you have to have that voice early on in the process. The second part of that is um, reimbursement. Um, this will be the you know first to uh, first to market with this type of technology, and so uh, making sure that we're thinking about reimbursement and how payers are going to look at this uh, real early on in the, in the clinical trials and uh, the cl- uh, clinical uh, protocols of this technology is is really critical. So um, even though we're not selling yet, um, you know the the thought of you know the right product and how the product gets paid for is something that you really have to think about upstream here. And is that something that we can look forward to? It's always difficult to predict the future in med tech with, with uh, regulatory bodies and clinical trials. But what's a what's a time frame you have in mind for when we might see these uh, see your impl- see your devices helping patients? Yeah, I mean, well, uh, I think as we speak, uh, you know, that the products in patients and mm-hmm. helping them uh, do their activities, and so. I think, um, although it's you know we're still in a clinical trial, you know these products are will be in people, and, and, and our goal is to obviously contribute towards driving independence in, in these uh, different activities that they do with the product. Um, when you look at a commercialization, when we really be on the market, we can really scale to commercialization. We're still a few years out um, from that, but again, uh, you know our next clinical trials will be, I think, will be very telling on efficacy and safety of the product, and really starting to define uh, define the field itself. Excellent. Well, we're excited to see that news when it comes out. But more uh, more recently, we're going to see you at Device Talks Boston. Happy to have you there. Excited to, to hear Synchron's story. And uh, thanks for being part of Device, Talk, Device Talks Boston and for joining us here today. Absolutely. Appreciate it, Tom. And uh, look forward to coming up there to Boston. All right. Our final interview is with Rajit Kamal. He is Vice President and General Manager of Robotic Surgical Technologies at Medtronic. And Rajit will be giving our closing keynote. So he'll be talking uh, at, in a larger room than I've got for device talks. He'll be talking upstairs at a robotic summit and expo to uh, to attendees from both meetings, both the robotic summit and expo and device talks Boston. He'll be giving a presentation on uh, on how Hugo can can operate remotely. We'll actually have a call. We're planning to have a call with London, and we'll be able to see that interaction. So uh, that should be really fascinating. Looking forward to seeing that. So I've talked about surgical robotics already, but uh, really grateful for Rajit, who have come to know really primarily through uh, Device Talks Boston uh, a lot. And I'm, I'm grateful for him coming out and making this presentation. I'm grateful to Medtronic. Uh, they did uh, make uh, time and space available at their new offices for some folks to visit on Tuesday. Unfortunately, that, that opportunity is closed. No one else can can get a ticket to that. But uh, it was it's a great way to start off device talks boston so let's hear from rajit kamal of medtronic and once again if you want to uh join us at device talks boston register at boston.devicetalks.com use the code dtweekly25 and you'll save 25 percent off the price of admission and let me just say if you're going to wait until the day to register it's fine if you want to do that but it's much easier to do it in advance um you'll wait in a shorter line and if you use that code you'll save some money but that's just me talking. All right, let's play this interview I did with Rajit Kamal once again. This was at the uh, 160 Studios at the Mullings Group. Hi, this is Tom Salemi from Device Talks. We're going to be covering the surgical robotics space uh, in a great deal at, at Device Talks Boston on May 1st and 2nd. We're going to be talking about a, ho- a lot of high level issues, but we're going to be able to focus on some of the leaders in the space as well. And we're going to be doing that today. I'm very happy to be joined by Rajit Kamal, who's Vice President and General Manager of Robotic Surgical Technologies at Medtronic. Rajit, thanks for joining us uh, on this discussion. It's a pleasure to be with you today, Tom. Thank you for having me. Oh, great to have Medtronic uh, have such a role at Device Talks Boston. You folks, I know, are neighbors of the of the conference. You're a few blocks away. So uh, looking forward to, uh, to having uh, your folks there and also having you giving our closing keynote where you'll be uh, giving a demonstration of the remote connectivity of the Hugo system. So uh, lots, to, lots to see at Device Talks Boston, and thanks again, Medtronic, for being such a, such a big part of it. 
Absolutely. And you should come and visit our office, Tom. We are, you know, stones throw distance from the convention center. <laughs> I, I, I am counting on that. That is going to be an exciting part of my, of my three days there. So uh, let's go step back. And, and uh, we, we like to build a conference around the, the, the notion of, of finding solutions for some of healthcare's biggest problems. What's the problem that you've identified, that Medtronic has identified uh, in the healthcare system that surgical robotics and Hugo in particular is, uh, well, let's talk about the problem first that you're trying to solve. What, what, what can uh, Hugo improve upon? Yeah, I mean, look, you know, think about robotics in general, Tom, right? Mm-hmm. So if you think about the penetration of robotics, it's about 5%. So 95% of the procedures today that could use a robotic solution are not using that. 60% of those are open procedures. Mm-hmm. Uh, they have a significant opportunity. The question we have to ask is, so what's the benefit of robotics over, say, laparoscopy, right? And there are a few things I will highlight. So if you if you look at a traditional laparoscopy, it is done using a 2D image. So a surgeon uses a 2D image. We don't have the depth perception. They use a straight instrument. Ergonomically, it is not the best for the surgeon. You know, with robotics, you get a magnified 3D vision, you have a much better vision of the surgical field. Mm-hmm. You have wristed instruments, you know, that basically works, you know, based on what you do with your normal normal arm. So uh, that makes maneuvering around tissue structures easier. Uh, with robotics, you can also bring AI-driven features. Uh, you can add AI-driven features, whether it is anatomic structure identification, bringing intraoperative insights. So I think robotics I, I always give an analogy of a car, right? 15 years back, I drove a car that didn't have GPS, no sensors, nothing. Today, I'm the same driver, mm-hmm. but now I have a car that tells me if I'm changing a lane, it flashes and says, oh, there's a car in your blind spot, right? Um, so it makes me, I think my outcomes ultimately would be better in terms of driving. I take the same analogy, uh, and I think robotics will have better experience for the surgeons. And I truly believe with all the features of better visualization, wristed instruments, AI-driven features will lead to better outcome for patients as well. You're, you're and and that's how we are, you know, that's why we are interested. We are a leader in surgery. This is where surgery is headed and that's why we are interested in this space. That's great. Uh, your car analogy hits home. I just was I rented a car and I'm driving a newer car and I was able to do so many things with my hand still on the wheel because of the, the current uh, systems, a lot better than the older car I'm driving. So I can totally connect. So let's talk a bit about Hugo in particular. What what functionality are you offering that's going to advance these procedures and to provide, as you said, all of that assistance uh, that that surgeons and, and, and physicians currently don't have? Yeah, absolutely. So let me just give you a quick background on Hugo, right? So Please. Hugo is a multi-port soft tissue robot. Uh, we have an open surgeon console, four modular arms, uh, internally developed at Medtronic, legacy Covidian. We did the first procedure with Hugo in June of 2021. It was a prostatectomy case that we did in Chile. Since then, Tom, we have come a long way. We are now in five continents. We are in over 20 countries around the world. Mm -hmm. Uh, And we have indications, broader indications, in markets like Europe, Australia, Japan, India, South America. We have indications for urology, gynecology, general surgery. We have now done thousands of procedures. You know, we are doing prostatectomies, hysterectomies, nephrectomy, cystectomy, bariatric surgery, hernia repair. Um, you know, US is the market we are still working on getting access to. Uh, we have now over 50 publications, Tom. Um, and the feedback has been very encouraging. And I will share some of the feedback that we are hearing from the field. You know, first is surgeons are saying in terms of procedural time and outcomes, uh, Hugo is very similar uh, to the system we have in the market, the mm-hmm. systems we have. So whatever is the soft tissue robotic benchmark, we are performing at par in terms of procedural time and outcomes. But there are three areas where they think we are differentiating. So one is the open surgeon console. Um, and surgeons highlight multiple benefits of that. One is the ergonomic benefit. You know, if you are in an open surgeon console, you're setting up right, right? Instead of um, you know, bending to look look into an immersive console. Mm-hmm. And that has ergonomic benefit for surgeons, especially those who do longer procedures. If you're doing a four or five hour procedure, um, you know, having an open surgeon console with a better ergonomic posture makes a big difference. In fact, one of the surgeons who does cystectomies, these are five, six hour cases, told me he chooses Hugo for himself 
not for the patient, but for himself, mm -hmm. because it is a better experience for him. Open Surge and Console also enables better collaboration because you can see the OR team. Um, and I think, you know, many laparoscopic surgeons tell me that's how they are used to operating, you know, engaging, looking at their uh, uh, their OR staff. So I think Open Surgeon Console drives better collaboration. The third thing is it is better for training. You can now have the residents observe what you are doing, you know, both your hand movements and what you're doing in the surgical field simultaneously. Um, they talk about the benefits of the modular arms. I think, you know, modularity enables Hugo to go into ORs of different shapes and sizes because it is a modular system. You can bring in fewer arms if you're doing a simpler procedure. So you can optimize the footprint in the OR. A lot of surgeons say who are laparoscopic surgeons. And if you think about 95% of the surgeons or surgeries that are not being done robotically, these are robotically, we call them robotically novice or naive surgeons. For them, the transition from laparoscopy to robotics is easier with a modular arm because it provides you flexibility in terms of port placement, in terms of docking. Um, the third area where we are hearing is our DS1 system, uh, which is through our touch surgery enterprise. So every time you finish a Hugo procedure, and if you have a DS1 system, you can access the video within a minute of completing the surgery. Wow. It automatically segments the video. Uh, surgeons are using that for presentation, for training, um, and we are actually going to use some of that video. Uh, you know, through our touch surgery enterprise, we have the largest surgical video of any 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 company, and we are going to use that as a training data to bring AI-driven features onto Hugo. So these are some of the feedback that we are getting, Tom. But you know, as I said, user experience, ergonomic, dock placement, flexibility. All these are the benefits that Hugo has brought to the table. Help me understand a bit more about the open surgery concept. What, how does that differ from what is currently available? You're standing upright, I imagine. Are you in some kind of booth, or what? What position is a surgeon is could, a surgeon in? Because I I agree. I, I imagine one of the bigger barriers is just making sure the surgeons are comfortable and, and can intuitively take over uh, uh, perform the procedure as opposed to learning a whole new platform and getting into positions that maybe they don't want to be in. So today there are two forms of console. So one is an immersive console where a surgeon is looking into a, a, a hole or a chamber. So you are immersed, so you can't see anything outside, right? Mm -hmm. You know, uh, we have an open surgeon console. So that means you are sitting, you wear a 3D glasses, okay. right? But you are you're not in a you know you're not immersed in a in a hole right you are actually open so you can look around you can see your or um, so those are the two different form factors that we have uh, the the market leader has an immersive surgeon console uh, you know some of the newer systems you know obviously we have an open surgeon console uh, so those are the two form factors you have in terms of surgeon console that are used in soft tissue robotics that makes perfect sense. Final question, what are some of the things we can look forward to uh, news coming fr from Hugo? What, what's next? Look, there are multiple things that we are working on. I will highlight a few things for you, Tom, right? So first thing is, you know, we are working very actively to bring our advanced instruments onto Hugo. So as you know, Medtronic is known for its stapling. It's known for Ligasure, which is our energy device. And these are clinically proven systems that, uh, instruments that surgeons trust in laparoscopic surgery. Mm -hmm. Uh, we are working very actively to bring them onto Hugo. So, so that's one we are looking at. The second area of focus is to get into the US market. You know, we announced uh, that we started our IDE in December of 2022. Uh, urology is the first indication. We publicly announced uh, that hernia, we just got approval for IDE for hernia. Uh, so we are actively working on completing those and bringing the Hugo system um, onto the US market. Uh, the third, as I mentioned, is to bring AI-driven features. We are working with our touch surgery enterprise in, in trying to leverage the data we have there to bring AI-driven features, whether it is an atomic structure identification, bringing interoperative insights uh, to complement the Hugo platform. Um, and the fourth thing I would say is we continue to make sure we have a differentiated training offering. Uh, we have partnered with you know, uh, uh, institutions around the world uh, and that's another area we continue to make improvements uh, to make sure that our training program is robust and, and differentiated. So those are the four broad areas, I would say, uh, that as a Hugo team, we are focused on. Fantastic. Well, we look forward to hearing much more at Device Talks Boston. Once again, thanks for being a, a big part of the program. And Rajiv Kamel, thanks for joining us uh, today to talk about Hugo. 
Thank you so much, Tom. I'm looking forward to seeing you at Device Talks. Thank you so much. All right, well, that is a wrap. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of the Device Talks Weekly Podcast. I can't say it in any other way. I sincerely hope that you'll join us at Device Talks Boston. As I said in my conversation with Paul, there is no virtual element, uh, so you can't watch this online. You got to be there. Um, so use the code DTWeekly25. It costs you a little over 500 bucks. I promise you it'll be worth it. Um, just the networking alone will be worth it. We've already got um, more people here than we did last year. We've got several more days for registrations, and we we always get a strong showing day of. Uh, once again, you can you can avoid the strong showing or avoid waiting in line to register and register now and use the code DTWeekly25, save money and save yourself a wait in line. But um, I'm so excited. Uh, I'm tired, but I'm so excited. And I can't wait to see everyone at the Boston Convention and Exhibition Center. Um, I really, I don't know what else to say. We'll be recording next week's episode of Device Talks Weekly once again uh, on stage at the end of Device Talks Boston. So uh, if you join us at Device Talks Boston, and I hope you do, join us for that recording. It'd be great to have you there. Uh, we try to bring some you know, folks in from the audience, some thoughts in as well. But we'll be doing a wrap-up of the conference and sort of a, a look forward. And uh, it's always a, a good conversation and a nice way to end. And uh, it will be, again, next week's uh, next week's episode. Final point of order for me, I'll be off the week after Device Talks Boston. Uh, I'm not, not actually collapsing into a pool of exhaustion, but I'll be driving out to Purdue University to bring my son home. So I'm looking forward to that. I'll be taking my other son with me. So we're having a nice little road trip. So I'll be off that following week. I don't think we'll have a podcast that follow, that week. Uh, and I'll, I'll make a mention of this next week when we put out the Device Talks Boston conference. But just wanted to, to put that out there. We will be putting out a uh, Abbott Talks podcast next week. So you'll have one of those as well. Great conversation I had uh, about diabetes. And uh, all right. That's it. Uh, again, Boston, Devi Device Talks Boston is taking place May 1st and May 2nd at the Boston Convention and Exhibition Center. It's going to be an insanely great time. And uh, I do hope you'll join us and use the code DTWeekly25 to save 25%. And if you do make it out, anyone who, ha who does make it out, please, if you see me walking by, um, just say hello or stop me at the, uh, or, or let's talk at the, uh, the opening reception or any of the receptions that are going on uh, on-site and off-site. Uh, there's been a, a real surge of um, satellite events that are happening, and that's exciting for me because, again, yes, I am a guy from Boston, and uh, it's been a real thrill to uh, to build what I think is uh, one of the better medtech events on the East Coast and uh, excited to have everyone be part of it. So join us there May 1st and May 2nd boston.devicetalks.com to register. That's it, folks. Thanks for listening to this episode. I hope you enjoyed it. And uh, I look forward to seeing you in Boston in just a couple of days.